For the next weeks, I'm going to have us uh, go into a little book in the, the New Testament called Galatians. It's uh, not a long book. Again, it's one of those books that you could probably read through without any effort by just spending a few minutes a day, um, each day for a week. It only has six chapters. And, uh, but it's a book that really opens some doors for us, even in a very contemporary uh, time in which we live, about what it means to be the person that God made us to be. How do we leave our mark on the world? And I've been studying the book and looking at it and finding that one of the key ways to sort of approach this book is to think in terms of the question of identity. And so uh, you'll be seeing some posters around and uh, we'll be spending some time during the summer uh, in the book of Galatians, one of Paul's earliest, if not his earliest writing, and uh, was obviously a letter that was designed for a group of people like ourselves living many years ago in what is now Turkey. Uh, but in some amazing ways, the things that they dealt with are the things that we deal with and what it means to really know who we are, what it means to be part of God's, uh, God's family as he is recreating that human race which is in so desperate need of repair. So we'll begin this morning in uh, chapter 1. And uh, to just sort of set the stage, I, I got to thinking about what's happened around the issue of identity in the past month, just in the month of June 2015. A CNN reported the past, this past Tuesday that as many as 18 million federal employees' records had been hacked by presumably some foreign power. For each of them, current employees, former employees, even people who may applied to be federal employees, life just got potentially a whole lot more complicated. Information crucial to their unique identity had been compromised and could now be used against them. Just about a week before that, a civil rights activist out in Washington state who had been serving as the, uh, the uh, chairperson or president of an NAACP chapter was discovered to actually not be of the race that she had presented herself to be. And so the whole nation sort of ricocheted from one issue to another and now was struggling with the whole question of what does it mean to have a racial identity. And that same month, just frankly maybe a week or two before that, uh, we were reading in the headlines that a former Olympic gold medalist would be having a reality show in the month of July celebrating her new identity. Are you confused yet? What does it mean to be a person, to have an identity? Is your identity yours to define? Or is it something that society gives to you? Is it something you're born with? Or is it simply something that you can put together? I guess the reason why identity is such a big deal is that identity is power. Your identity allows you to make your mark on the world. When somebody steals your identity, whether they steal your credit card information or your social security number, or perhaps they just impose themselves upon you and force you to be what they wanted you to be, when they steal your identity, they then get to use whatever resources and potential you had to make their mark on the world. And you're never allowed then to make your unique contribution. Uh, when someone fakes an identity, they leverage that falsehood to gain power and influence where they didn't really have it in the first place. Sometimes we become very, very desperate to have a change in our identity. Probably every one of us has come to those places where we looked at ourselves and maybe just didn't like what we saw in the mirror. We said, I got to change that. And we do all sorts of things, uh, some of them very healthy, some of them probably very questionable, to try to put together, cobble together an identity that will allow us to finally make our mark in the world. What's it mean to make your mark in the world? Why is identity so important to that? Well, I brought along a tool, as Andrew said, a prop. Probably all know what this thing is here. A little cordless drill. Tremendous power. More power than I can handle if I try to just hold on to it with my hand and slow it down and, and try to make it not do what it's supposed to do. But you know something? This thing is all potential and utterly useless in its current form. If you look in there, there's nothing in there. This thing can't do a thing except make some sparks and make some noise. However, if I put a drill bit in it, then I have the, ca the capacity to, um, 
to drill holes, and all of a sudden, this thing has an identity. It's now not just a cordless drill, it actually has a drill bit in it, and it can drill a very precise hole. Now, it couldn't do that until it was fully identified by what was in the tip. However, it's useful. I can also, and have all this, this, this spring working on my boat. I've decided I didn't need to drill holes in my boat, <laughs> but I did need to do some sanding. And so the same tool with a new identity becomes a very powerful little sander. And um, of course, then again, when you get some projects going and you know you need to put a screw into, into a board, you take out the drill bit because you don't want to drill a hole in the board. You don't want to sand the board. You put the screwdriver tip in. Three different identities, three totally different ways of using the same thing. You and I are perhaps somewhat like that. You have a tremendous potential, far greater than a cordless drill is going to run out of power in about, what, X number of hours. You have a potential that God built into you something that he understood and that he could envision in some mysterious way now long before you were, as we say, a sparkle in your mom or your dad's eyes. And here you are today, somewhere in the midst of your life journey. You still have that potential. You may have realized some of it. There may be the lion's share of it just right out there waiting to happen. But until you know who you are, and whether you're the sander or the drill or the screwdriver, whatever your, your role is, until you know who you are, that potential is just a potential. And if you try to be something that you weren't made to be, you're probably going to make a mess of things. Uh, believe me, you get the wrong tool on a, on a machine like that, and you can make a whole lot of mess in a very, very big hurry. Because, again, each one of us has a special identity for a special task, something that only we can fulfill. And one of Paul's great concerns in this little book of Galatians is that we discover that identity and that we then become fully effective in what God called us to be. Now, I checked on Google, that, and it said that in September of 2010, there were 1,470,680 people in the United States with the first name of Paul. <laughs> Whatever. Every one of them derives his name from a Jewish rabbi who lived 2,000 years ago at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Go figure. Who would have thunk it? If you had said to Paul, Paul, did you know that 2,000 years from now, in one country that hasn't even been invented yet, there will be a half, million and a half people with your name as their first name, whether they even know who you were or not, he would have had no idea. But talk about leaving your mark in the world that a man from an ancient time, basically a, a rabbi who fell out with his, his home group and then traveled around as much despised by people as loved by people, who was assassinated or executed under Nero uh, during a time of, of political persecution, that that man would leave a mark on the world that would be so great that, yes, we would be actually reading his writings 2,000 years later, and that people would actually carry his name, whether they even knew who he was or not. Obviously, Paul made a mark on this world. How did that come to be? Who was this guy? What made him so effective so that, that his, his impact would be that sharp and that, that direct that his identity could change a world that he never even knew would come to exist? Well, Paul tells us his identity in the very first words of this little letter that we read. Now, you have to understand, back in ancient times in the Roman Empire, when you wrote a letter, you didn't start it with dear so-and-so. You started it with your name so they knew who was writing to them, and then you addressed the people that you were writing to. And so that's why the letter starts in verse 1 with these words. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men or by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Paul starts with his name, which would have been appropriate, and then with his identifier, an apostle. Well, right there, we need to stop say, okay, so what's an apostle? You've probably all heard the word, but what does it mean? The word apostle is a Greek word that comes from two words, apo, which means from, and stello, which means to send. It means someone who is sent. Someone sent on a mission, somebody who had a particular message as part of that mission. 
Uh, basically, what, what it all had to do with was the fact that you couldn't be everywhere at once in the ancient world. You couldn't Skype yourself in. You couldn't do FaceTime with people. Uh, there was no email. There were no telephones. So if you had to conduct business, and people did all across that large empire, and you couldn't be in two places at the same time, you sent somebody in your place. And they were fully delegated, sort of like we would say they would have power of attorney, if you will, to come into a situation, to negotiate for you, to make decisions, to sign off on things. In fact, it was said that a, a person's delegate or apostle is like himself. So whatever that person said in a meeting or in a negotiation or in a sale of something or purchasing something had all the authority of the person who sent him or sent her. So for Paul, when he said, I'm an apostle, people knew, first of all, what he was talking about. They were saying he's a delegate. He's an emissary. He has authority of, from someone who's sending him. And for Paul, that meant speaking and acting as a delegate, as he says, from Jesus Messiah, Jesus the King, and the great Creator God. Paul had been entrusted with a life and world-changing message. The same God that he believed had conquered death by raising Jesus was now announcing the good news that the world's true king was coming to reclaim his lost creation. I mean, this is the message of restoration. This was God coming and saying, yes, this place is a mess, and yes, each one of you has problems, and yes, each one of you have done things that have hurt yourselves and others, and here is the path forward. Now, Paul goes on to say in verses 3 to 5, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, those are the ones who sent him, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There's that message. This is sort of the, the sort of nutshell, if you will, or the, the, the kernel of what Paul has to say as an apostle, as a messenger. He is saying there's a way out. There is a rescue mission underway, and I'm announcing that pathway out. Paul wastes no time getting down to business for why he actually was writing this letter. It turns out that even back in that time, there were people around who wanted to steal Paul's identity and wanted to hack into his message. Uh, he had this special message. He called it the gospel or the good news. The good news that Jesus had died to take the, the, the guilt and the evil and the sin of the world and that God had raised him and created this new path uh, into God's new, new life and new creation. And Paul had gone to Galatia. He had planted churches there. He had uh, formed relationships with people. Then when he left, others came in, and they said, well, we're the genuine apostles. We're sent from God. We know more than this other guy that was here. And they began to hack his message. Listen to how Paul puts it, and leave it to Paul. He always gets right to the point. You always know where he stands. Verses 6 and 7, he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. What's going on here? Well, Paul is looking at the work that he did, looking at this amazing pathway out of darkness and into light and out of guilt and into uh, into freedom, and he's seeing that it's being hacked back down into the same old, same old of how people have tried to work it out for themselves, creating rules and re regulations and squeezing people into their mold, giving people their idea of what their identity should be instead of letting them discover it in this relationship with the God who made them. And so Paul's pushing back, and he's saying, no, I won't accept that. I'm going to stand up for the message God gave me and the identity God gave me. I have not yet, thank goodness, uh, had the, the uh, misfortune of having my personal information hacked. But I know people who have, and I know what happens. Of course, I've had a few scares with my credit card. Anybody else ever had a scare with your credit card? You got to go make the call. Please cancel the card. I remember one occasion where it was one of those telemarketing deals, and I just normally, I just don't. You know, sorry, I just don't listen. But this one time, I started down the little path, and, oh, we've got this great rate for you, and, hmm, well, I could use a better rate. And we got a little deeper into the great rate, and then, well, I just need a little bit of information. Can I have your social? <gasps> By then, I'd already given them the credit card number. 
I thought, since when does anybody want my social on the phone? Click, hung up. And I called the credit card company. Well, just to be sure, we're going to issue a new card. You been there? So the new card means now that the old card doesn't do all the things that it was doing, like the online giving to the district and like this bill that gets paid and, and this situation over here and how does Amazon work? And so all of a sudden, the great scramble was on to reassemble my identity out there in credit card land. Well, Paul's doing kind of that same thing here when he realizes that everything he's worked for is going to be lost because somebody wants to steal his identity, put their tool in, and go do his job, and what's the result going to be? It's all going to be mashed up. Now, Paul says, look, before we go any further, let me explain to you how I came to know who I am how I came to this unique identity that I'm going to be defending and that I'm definitely going to be reminding you of and the message that comes with it. This is a very fascinating picture because it talks to you and me about how we come to understand our identity and whether it's something that we put together or borrow and patch together or steal from somebody else or whether it's, there's something uniquely connected to God doing a new thing in our lives. So he says in verses 11 and 12, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, what's he saying here? Well, he was from a very ancient religious tradition, one that went back easily maybe 1,000, 1,500 years, more than that. And in that tradition, Truth and knowledge and wisdom and things to believe were passed along very carefully from one generation to the next. Nothing wrong with that. But God was doing something very new here, and that's how, what Paul had come to understand. And so he says, while all the other stuff is good and of value, I want you to understand something radical happened to me. God revealed a new message to me. And so this new identity was not just something that he sort of stepped into as the next in line. Like, okay, I'll take over where you leave off, and then I sort of lose myself in this role and carry it on until somebody else comes along. He said, no, this was like an in-breaking thing. This was a revelation thing, a something between God and myself and something God wants to do for you. The story of that new identity involved losing an old one and gaining a new one. He says in verses 13 and 14, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God, which, of course, were all Jewish people, we understand, at that time, and tried to destroy it. I was advancing uh, in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. It says some of the same things in another letter, which sort of flesh out the picture, Philippians 3, verses 4 to 6. Listen to this. Description of Paul, but from Paul, this is his former identity. And listen to all the identifiers. We'll kind of pick them out as we go along. He says, if anyone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in flesh in his earthly life, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. What a list of things that would describe how Paul saw himself and how everyone else saw him. And these were all perfectly honest on his part. I mean, this is who he wanted to be. He was properly circumcised as a, as a little baby, as a Jewish little boy. He was an Israelite, a Benjaminite. He was Hebrew. He was a Pharisee. He was a persecutor. He was faultless. And Paul worked hard to develop this image, this ideal, this identity. This was what he had devoted his life to as a young man growing up uh, in um, what would now be Turkey, and then moving to Jerusalem and going to school and studying under the best of the rabbis in Jerusalem, memorizing his, his uh, Torah, knowing the Bible better than any, any of us would ever possibly be able to imagine it, learning other things about his culture and his society, putting it all together. He was a rising star. And he says, yeah, I was, when it came to doing the deal, I was faultless. Until one day, this 
Jewish Messiah, Jesus, broke into his life. When that happened, everything changed. In the book of Acts, we read that he was sent as an apostle, as a sent one, to go up to the city of Damascus, from Jerusalem to Damascus, to round up members of this sect, the, what was one day to be called Christianity, so the sect called the Way, and bring them back to, as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, please understand, at this point in time, this was entirely an inter-Jewish issue. Paul was Jewish. These early followers of Jesus were Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. There were other Jewish groups that didn't agree with the path that Jesus had, had spelled out. So they were kind of having a little inter-Jewish uh, conflict here. And Paul was part of that, or as his name then was Saul. You probably know the story that in, on the way to Damascus to continue growing in that identity and bringing those tools to bear against this, Jew, this Christian sect, we read Acts chapter 9, uh, verses 3 to 6. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, that was his Jewish name, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Here is a man fully engaged in what he thought was his true identity. And in literally a matter of seconds, he has this visionary experience. He experiences the presence of God, and he starts on a whole new path with a whole new identity. And that's what he means when he says, it was revealed to me. God broke into my life. I never would have figured this out on my own. I never would have been able to put all the pieces together. In fact, my life was going in the exact opposite direction. I never would have even thought I would want to do something like that. But this Jesus revealed himself to Paul, gave him a new message and a new mission. And that's why Paul says at the beginning of this letter, and as he says many times in his writings, I'm an apostle and a servant, even a slave of this new king, this King Jesus. He says in verses 15 to 16, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. What a radical change. You may be wondering yourself, well, what is this new identity thing that God has? How do you find that? How do you go about that? All too confusing for me. I'm too busy just trying to pay my bills. I'm feeling swamped by my own little life. Well, here is a man who was convinced beyond any question that he was on the right path. But it was a path he'd created for himself, or out of the things that he knew and out of his own background and out of the feelings that he had, defending various things and wanting to grow and become important. And then all of a sudden, God came to him and said, you're going down the wrong path. You're a powerful tool, Paul. But you've got the wrong, the wrong bit in the drill. You're out there drilling holes, but you're sinking boats instead of fixing them. Let me, let me take out that old and put in the new thing that will make you effective. And so Paul, that's why he says, it was revealed to me by God. I can't be false to this. This changed my life. What kind of mark did Paul make on his world with this new identity? In verses 22 to 24, he sort of, sums up the impact of this radical life change. He says, I was personally unknown to churches of Judea that are in Christ, in the Jerusalem area. They only heard the report, quote, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. We know Paul's impact would go far beyond that little testimonial. We know that like I say, 1,480,000 people still bear the name of Paul as a first name 2,000 years later because he literally went on to change his world. He never would have done that on the old path that he was on. He would have been popular. He would have, been, would have probably been revered and perhaps quoted by his contemporaries and by subsequent generations of, a, of, his, of his religious tradition. But frankly, none of us can rattle off the names of the great rabbis of Judaism, unless we are really deep into that area of, of study. Now, Paul became a person who impacted the lives of people of 
potentially every single culture in the world. Radically different view of who he was and of what God wanted to do through him. Like Paul, we need to learn that God has a new identity for us. What is that? I don't have a clue. For you, I don't even know what it is for me until God shows it to us. When we use the word reveal, that means we're talking about something that we can't figure out. It's not something that if you think about it long enough, you'll get it or you'll connect all the dots. Revealing something means we have something shared with us that we never would have been able to know on our own. And for Paul, that was a life change that took him from one religious path, turned him all the way around, and made him the greatest advocate of the thing that he had tried to destroy. Now, you know, like I said before, a cordless drill with the wrong bit can do a world of harm. I hate to think what would happen if uh, a little kid got a hold of this on my boat <laughs> while we were sailing along. <laughs> Look, Grandpa. <laughs> Look at all the little fountains I made. <laughs> Paul was like that drill. Powerful personality, brilliant mind, boundless energy, but like a drill with the wrong bit. He was leaving a trail of wreckage in his effort to force the world into doing what he thought was God's thing. What a difference when he abandoned that old, failed identity and accepted his true identity, the one that the Creator God had always intended for him. Like he said, back when I was formed in my mother's womb, God already had this amazing plan. <laughs> it took me a while to catch up with what God was going to do. Isn't that the same thing for you and me? God didn't put you here by accident. God still wants you here, or guess what? You wouldn't be here. He has work for us to do. And every day is an opportunity for us to discover some new piece of that genuine, that true identity. It's not something that we can steal from somebody else or borrow or copy. It's not something where we stand in the mirror and learn how to make it work. I always get a kick out of talking with, with younger pastors because I had the same thing going on when I was first getting started. You'd hear so-and-so preach, and then you come up, and people kind of were noticing your ma mannerisms and gestures and voice might sort of sound like the person you were watching on TV or listening to. And then and you get on to a new better model, and then you switch your style and sort of copy that person because you didn't know who you were yet. What a difference when we find out who God made us to be. You're a one-off, a one-of-a-kind for a very special purpose. And one of the things that I'm excited about with, with restorative justice is that that same thing is true for folks whose lives have gone down bad paths for whatever reasons. And again, it's not about how did we get here, it's how do we go forward. And one of the things that I know that you've dedicated your time in serving there was to help them find a new identity, a new way of seeing themselves, a new way. I am not just that. I am not just what society had to deal with or what people told me I was, but I can be somebody else. And there had to be people who believed in you, in that person, to help them make those steps and hold them accountable to them. Well, the same is true for you and me. God has a true identity for you by which you will make your mark on this world. You're not going to create it by trying to borrow it from somebody else or come up with it out of your head. It's something God reveals to us. And one of the things we'll do in this study is we'll, we'll spend some time to find out how that happens and what that looks like. Right now, I just want to spark your curiosity. What is it, Lord, that you see in me that I don't even know is there yet? where my true identity could have the most powerful impact on the most precious people in my life and in our community. Paul said it just right when he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, 